Hi everyone, welcome to Safe Space, where live questions are talked about from theological perspectives. I'm Debbie, thanks for joining me today. As Christians, our world tends to revolve around things like the mechanics of how we are saved and how we are becoming more like Jesus, justification and sanctification, our Christian character and morals, whether we are forgiving, are we caring, are we excellent in what we do, our relationships, we have topics like marriage, life as a parent, sexual purity, as well as serving in church, like pastoral ministry, music ministry, flower arrangements, and so on and so forth. But how about matters relating to society and public life? What does a Christian do to contribute in the political, social, and economic realms? We talk a lot of personal transformation, but what about social transformation or structural transformation? Does our life in Jesus inform only the private life, but is silent about the public life? Is it normal for Christians or okay for Christians to have Bible-based convictions on marriage fidelity, but no Bible convictions on the social economic situation of the world that he or she is living in? Is it normal or okay for Christians to be super strict against sexual sin, but be lax or silent on racial discrimination? This is what we are talking about today in this episode of Safe Space. So gentlemen, most Christians think of ministry as teaching the Bible, preaching, pastoring, or working in church. What you do seems a bit avant-garde for some of us. So can you describe in your own words, what exactly do you do? In the last 10 years, I have been associated or working directly with the Institute of Ethnic Studies at the University Kebangsaan, Malaysia in which I am a principal research fellow. So much of the work is about research, consultancy, uh, advocacy, uh, and a role in terms of a public intellectual or in the public space uh, in, in the kind of the work. Uh, and in terms of the themes that I'm looking at, uh, include sustainable development goals, community base, uh, urban poverty, human rights violations and so forth. Uh, so in many ways, uh, it addresses the key issues of society at a macro level, as well as being an, a, a sociologist, mm. I sort of address uh, the ground realities uh, through you know, um, action research and other sorts and then bring it in. And part of the work is also with civil society, uh, like the uh, CSO SDG Alliance and the associated organizations like ProHarm or the Foundation for Community Studies and Development mm -hmm. and then to integrate um, the sort of policy work uh, with concrete action. And, and I'm also quite active in the local church giving talks uh, and trying to mobilize Christian action. So it's cutting across uh, various areas. How about you, Eugene? Uh, after leaving the uh, NECF, the National Evangelical Christian Fellowship, uh, I'm right now currently the executive director of the Kairos Dialogue Network. The Kairos Dialogue Network has three uh, emphasis. The first emphasis, of course, is on uh, having the dialogues and engagement with Muslims, uh, not just uh, the Muslims that we see, but the Muslims on the ground. Mm. Uh, and that also includes uh, Muslims uh, NGOs uh, in particular. The second uh, area that Kairos Dialogue Network engages in is what we call Harmony Projects. Mm. Uh, and in, in that respect, we work with what we call the civil society organization. And we work very closely with the civil society under the Gabungan Bertindak Malaysia, GBM. And the third uh, focus that we have is actually on monitoring religious freedom violations. Uh, and this one is actually more particularly in relation to the situation in Sabah and Sarawak. Uh, and in that way, we also, what you call, uh, make contribute reports uh, and commentaries to what you call the advocacy uh, organizations, both locally as well as internationally. So that's in somewhat we do. 
So it was uh, interesting, uh, Eugene, your, the progress and, and the different uh, changes in your vocation. Why do you feel that KDN was something you needed to do? Uh, well, I started out as a lawyer. Uh, and even as a lawyer, I was involved in religious freedom cases. Then in the mid-2000s, uh, I was in the NECF. Uh, and in my tenure, about seven to eight years in NECF, one of the things I noticed within the Christian community is this, uh, just two things. One was there was very little bridge building efforts to Muslim communities. Uh, there were more for generally non-Muslim communities. But for some reason or another, there was very little bridge building efforts towards Muslim communities. Mm -hmm. So that was something that needed to, we needed to actually bridge, you know, uh, a gap that we needed to bridge. The second thing that I also noticed while I was in NECF is that uh, while we spoke a lot about Christian rights, you know, Christian rights, Christian uh, freedom of religion and all, mm -hmm. we never bridged the gap to look at how the other side look at issues. Uh, so it was also during, when I was in NCF, it was also during the era where the situation between Christian and Muslim in terms of their relationship worsened. Uh, there was a lot of tension within that time. And uh, I noticed that uh, the Christian groups uh, or the Christian church never reached out and never sought to understand what the Muslim groups uh, was thinking or what the Muslim communities was feeling. So uh, after my stint with NECF and after my tenure in NECF, I felt that that was a gap that needed to be, uh, uh, what you call, we needed to actually patch up the gap, needed to bridge that gap. And so uh, together with some other, other brothers in Christ uh, who share, who is like-minded, we uh, formed what is called a Kairos Dialogue Network for that purpose, to bridge build and also to converse with the Muslim the other side, looking at how they look at issues and how they feel about certain, certain things they have developed. That's basically great. Yeah, I think we certainly resonate with what you do because I think uh, we can understand that uh, many times we give comments from our little corners, but we don't actually come out together uh, to speak on a mutual platform. And I think it's also very gracious for Christians uh, when, when we try to listen and to understand the other party uh, before we impose or we demand and make certain demands um, from other communities. Yes, that's precisely. Thank you. So um, how about uh, you, Dato? Uh, you were a pastor and you worked in Malaysian care even before getting into policy advocacy and now academia. How did this change come about? I think one, one could say the Lord uh, reveals progressively different things. If, if at um, 19 or 20 when I felt the sense of call into full-time work, if I was told I would be at UKM, uh, you know, over you know, 30, 40 years or so, I might have not believed it because my vision was very limited uh, to church mm -hmm. work and activities related to church ministry. But while I was at church ministry, that the needs of the community and in the inability in one sense of the local church to effectively respond uh, to human needs, suffering, uh, injustices that uh, families were facing, like for example in the plantations that I saw, or in the context of uh, ex-prisoners or the Orang Asli community, that actually opened up the avenue to move on uh, into Malaysian care. But in the Malaysian care work that we were doing, it was largely responding to human compassion, from, from compassion to meeting human needs. Uh, but in that, we could express it to a few individuals around. And over the, the type of work we were doing at Malaysian Care, whether it was with disabled people, the urban poor, rural poor, uh, prisoners, um, uh, emotionally ill, one automatically realizes public policy is an important dimension mm -hmm. and advocacy or highlighting to government the shortfalls, budgetary requirements. Mm -hmm. It was just logical. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was in that point that we needed to see a more professional social work training, yeah. uh, policy advocacy, uh, and so forth. So for me, there was a transition then from theology into sociology. Mm -hmm. In some sense, it's not that tough. One study of God, and then you're then motivated to study society 
uh, in the way you want to effectively respond, not just to short-term needs, which is needful, but you want to address the institutional or sy uh, systemic uh, problems. Uh, and that's how the switch in many ways came for me uh, to look into public policy. And over the years, uh, my YSS days, that means after pastoral work, I then went on, after five years, went on to Malaysian care eight years, and then did my PhD in England, uh, and then joined a cabinet minister uh, and worked for about 10, 11 years. It was during that time that I was involved with the Economic Planning Unit or Royal Police Commission, Human Rights Commission, and also in development planning at the highest level, reading reports, briefing, uh, and things of that sort. So seeing the need for research of some kind that addresses socio-economic issues. Mm -hmm. I didn't move that much to interfaith dialogue and thing. Mm -hmm. So it was more urban poverty. Yeah. Uh, it was looking at human rights violations. Mm -hmm. It was then looking at land issues of indigenous people. They're all interrelated to human mm -hmm. suffering or impact of urbanization. Mm -hmm. And so in that shift, advocacy mm -hmm. becomes quite key. Uh, to voice out, to highlight, to organize and mobilize. And, and research is a key mm. component mm. Uh, for policy advocacy. So that's the shift over the years. Mm. Uh, but it, I didn't start off as a social researcher. Yeah. I started off as uh, someone interested to do gospel work yeah. uh, and felt called at that point uh, and started with the Bible. Mm. And I have this uh, little joke about why the Lord uh, didn't take me to sociology first, okay. but took me to theology. Because I would think if I started with sociology, I might have ended up as a Marxist. You know? <laughs> but because yes. I started with theology, mm -hmm. I get the God perspective right. Mm. And then from sociology, whether it's Karl Marx or Max Weber mm. or other thinkers, you draw the social analysis, the tools, but you still hold firm to a theistic view of society mm. and the change and transformation that you want. So you don't become atheist in that process, but from a theistic confidence of hope for change. Mm. Uh, and I think that's the significance in my life. If I was to re-look back yeah. to why I didn't go to, because I think like, in the case of uh, most other pastors, mm. they have a first secular degree, they yeah. worked for a while, and then they went. Mm. Mine was, I started in theology, pastoral work, mm. and then came out into the secular. Mm. So people tend to think you have lost the call, or you have fallen away, mm -hmm. sort of arguments. So interestingly, uh, both of you have mentioned um, your participation in civil society. I think that's a commonality among the both of you. Um, Eugene, you mentioned that uh, you work with uh, uh, NGOs in civil society. Uh, Dr. Tok, you mentioned about talking uh, about uh, working on the social structures of our time. Now, um, what responsibility or why do you think it's important for us to be concerned towards the social structures of our time or even desire for a change in the social structures of our time? Well, having heard uh, Denison, I want to just say, uh, if I didn't, uh, if I was like him started in theology, I would have actually ended up as a pastor. I don't think I would have ended up as a sociologist. <laughs> uh, and that basically, uh, you know, that's the background that I come from, been coming from a very traditional church. Uh, but that, that underlines uh, the, the, the one of the problems and even may even be the challenges of our time today that our gospel is so much into the spiritual aspect. Uh, this is not to say that spiritual aspects are important, but, uh, but we are so much into the spiritual aspect that we have forgotten or we have neglected the engagement on society issues. Mm. So, so that I think is uh, something that as, uh, you know, as I go along, I, as I said, uh, I always wanted to be a pastor uh, that was my ambition, 
But uh, as I went along, the one thing that I discovered was that uh, while the gospel talks about the spiritual aspect, it is not just a spiritual aspect, there was also a societal aspect. And gradually, especially when I was in NECF, I began to ask the question, you know, uh, what is my role in terms of society? Now, that question came not just from during my time in NECF. Before my stint in NECF, uh, I spent a couple of years in typing, uh, which church was average age in terms of the membership of the church was 58 years old, average. 58 and 60 and above. And I, it was in that context that I asked the question, why is the church at one point in time producing good disciples and even many of the Christian leaders today are coming from Taiping Gospel Hall, that's their heritage. Why is it that today the church is 58, 60 years old, average age? The oldest is 85. And the church was dying. And I asked the question, why is it that a church which has a, a heritage, if it has a good reputation in terms of what they have uh, developed and have produced leaders in the past, why is it that they are like that? And I asked that question, and that answer gradually came to me by, with the realization that uh, our focus has so much been on the gospel and spiritual aspect that we forget about making an impact in society, that we become uh, something irrelevant, our messages become irrelevant, and so consequently people don't want to go to church anymore. So that built in me the idea that I must be responsible, not just on the spiritual aspect, on theology, but my responsibility is also towards engaging issues of society or wider society. My background. Thank you. Mm. How about you, Dato? What responsibility do we have as Christians towards the social structures of our time? I think I would agree uh, with Eugene in the context that uh, faith has been very much personalized mm. to individual sin and repentance. I think it's an important dimension because faith has the direct um, uh, correlation to experience with the living God and faith. Mm. But that faith that is the saving grace for us needs to be uh, engaging and transforming society mm. to make it more pleasing. I think it's, it's an issue of theology. And there are very conservative Christians who are very narrowed in their biblical teaching and understanding. So post-conversion, I was discipled by a brethren a leader, actually the Gospel Hall, uh, uh, William Dorasami oh, from so, Banting, yes, yes, yes. Uh, plus OMF missionaries, and then uh, with pastors from India who came to our Tamil churches, I then went to an evangelical seminary in India for five years. So my five years in India, I actually hardly did any poverty work or even exposure to justice and injustice issues. It was actually in the work, in the plantation, when I was sent as a pastor, trainee pastor, and then subsequently, that one began to see that here are real born-again Christians who were getting very low salaries, were living in very bad social conditions, and although they worked from morning till night, they remained poor. And it was during that time that um, I came and encounter with two different organizations. Actually, the Consumer Association of Penang hosted a special discussion for pastors. And this is surprising. Peter Young came for that and I was there as a young pastor and the whole pastoral group. And people like Martin Kaur were the speakers. And they were trying to see what would Jesus do in the context of the poor. That was almost the first sort of introduction post the estate. And the second influence at that time was the Aleran movement that Chandra was leading uh, in the 80s or the early periods for institutional reform. And during that time, by God's grace, I got this opportunity to go to the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity that John Stott was running. I went in the second batch, hosted by John Stott with yeah. the funding and other things in 1983, mm. 
Uh, and during that time, these issues of injustice, structural sin, yeah. and how the environment is affected, how society, and that God has an interest, not just in saving our souls and abandoning the earth, but we, as long as we are here till the second coming, have a responsibility uh, to impact society. That teaching came very strong to me and that affected the kind of pastoral work I was doing mm -hmm. and subsequently to Malaysian care mm -hmm. uh, into social and Malaysian care also moved on to take up issues of justice, yes. Yes. long term. It shifted from residential, compassionate type of care mm -hmm. to community work mm -hmm. and policy work. So I think in that sense, it's a theological understanding where evangelicals have narrowed and we have moved away from early missionaries who like uh, William Carey or all the other principal missionaries who didn't see a dichotomization yeah. of the gospel. Mm. They brought education, yep. they brought health care, they sought to reform the societies that they were in and they saw it all interrelated. We have sort of professionalized and said, this is a pastor, this is an advocate, this is a social, and, and as a result, ministry seemed to isolate the theology mm -hmm. from the actual practice and influence. So even uh, faith, engaging with Muslim communities or understanding mm -hmm. uh, or building bridges is something that one has kept away from because of the kind of theology. But I think increasingly the church has changed uh, to be far more engaging, not only in Malaysia, but all over the world. Mm. Since the Luzon movement, the global, uh, yeah. global, the Luzon movement, uh, Tier Fund, World Vision, global bodies that have emerged, and also local churches. Mm. Yeah, Dato, I really resonate with what you said about um, dichotomization. And um, when you mentioned William Carey, it reminded me of, he was amazing. Uh, I think he, um, he, was, he operated a printing service. Yes. yes. He was a botanist. He did all kinds of things and, you know. Linguist, he translated. That translated, yeah. mm. so He set up a college that still is there at Sarampo now. Mm. I visited it a few years ago. Mm. The printing press was sold off. Uh, but the other institutions remain, including his house. Yep. And so it seems like the understanding is that the arrival of the kingdom of God yes. touches through every sphere, not just the, the privatized religious life, yes. but also um, as God is coming to redeem his world, it's not just to save humans um, or to save individuals, but to, um, uh, as the kingdom of God comes, it brings renewal to communities. Uh, it brings uh, justice to communities. Uh, it also brings um, reconciliation between creation and humans as well. Yes. Uh, and so it's a very holistic way of looking at things. So I like to discover, you know, um, whether on a you know biblical level, um, is whether social change is something that Christians should be concerned about. And I guess maybe to answer the question, I would like to ask, you know, are there any key biblical passages? that inform and compel you to do what you are doing, such as like a biblical mandate that you um, cling on to? Maybe Eugene can go first. Mm. I think to me, there are many, many biblical passages. Uh, even if you look at the Old Testament going into the New Testament, no? uh, we have biblical passage that tells us that we should be compassionate mercy. Uh, we have in the New Testament, we have biblical passage coming from the Lord himself to say, love your neighbors. Uh, I don't think we are short of biblical passages or even mandate. I think it's the, 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 the challenge here is how we understand these biblical passages. Take for example uh, a very important uh, key biblical passage that every, and I think every Christian will know, is love your neighbor as yourself. Now, uh, that one everybody knows. but. The challenge, as I said, is how do you understand this biblical passage, love your neighbor. When I say love your neighbor, my, the interpretation and understanding is I love you because I want to speak to you, I want to get you uh, to repent of your sins and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and full stop. So that's one understanding. 
But we don't think that perhaps their understanding could also extend beyond that to include love your neighbor means when I see him poor, I see him hungry, I see him poverty stricken, I need to do something. Love your neighbors will also mean that he's being oppressed, either through some dictator or some structure or some arrangement, social arrangement, he's being uh, oppressed, we need to do something. Love your neighbors will also mean that we see a person being discriminated based on religious ground or racial grounds. We need to also do something. Love your neighbor could also mean that, well, we genuinely need to understand what the other community is thinking on the particular issues. And in this case, uh, I'm talking about the issues with the Muslims. We tend to stereotype the Muslim as they are nothing more than terrorists uh, because of the events of 9-11. We think that they are out to bomb us. We think that they are out to dominate us. We think that they are actually nothing more than trying to uh, you know, pretend to be nice to us, but at the end of the day, trying to convert us to become Muslims. So we need to also undo or deconstruct the stereotypes. So love your neighbors could also mean that. So in all these instances that I've just named, uh, we don't interpret, we don't understand love your neighbors to include these examples that I've just set before you. We always think love your neighbors means I need to get you to repent and then accept the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, th there are plenty of biblical passages. My point is there are plenty of biblical passages, but I think our understanding is perhaps a bit narrow, perhaps a bit exclusive, and we have not learned to extend our understanding and appreciation and consequently our application uh, to this uh, wider thought or wider thinking. Uh, that's the, 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 the challenges. Uh, if we do that and we expand our thinking into a more holistic, perhaps a wider range, uh, I think these biblical passages, there are many in the Bible, uh, will be very meaningful and it will inform our engagement. It will inform our engagement. So that's the way I, I look at it. You know, plenty of challenges ahead. Yeah, yep, certainly I think you have expanded our imagination of our neighbour because uh, neighbour can be such a generic term but I think you have helped us to, to make it more specific. Who are my neighbours? So if my neighbours are the migrant community, if my neighbours are a, a national neighbour, if my neighbours are refugees, um, certainly my love um, for neighbour expands, that whole concept expands. And I think that's a good um, cue for us to, to, to get from there. How about you, uh, Dato? What are the I, I think I would agree with Eugene in, in terms that there are sufficient Bible passages. But the problem with us is, how are we reading the Bible? So it's a matter of interpretation. So if we take from Genesis to Revelation, and, and it's theological as well. So, do we, so if we take the understanding of God, so if God is narrowed down to my God and God is concerned only for spiritual, so there's a dichotomy uh, in terms of what is God's concern for the world. But if we read through the whole Old Testament, God's concern is for the nations, for society, for justice. So all those uh, references to the prophetic traditions and themes of that sort, it's we are under reading it or we have over spiritualized those passages to narrow in the interpretation so whether it is the theme of god a theme of salvation mm. a theme of god's concern for the earth we have narrowed it down to life after rather than life now so the whole Levitical laws, Deuteronomy passage, prophetic utterances have no real relevance other than to personal ethics. But the nations of the world were judged by justice or the injustice, what they did and didn't do, uh, and that needs to be applied. So I, I would then see uh, from the teachings of Jesus that the way he defined his mission uh, in Luke 4, that passage of what he quotes from Isaiah 61, then is whether you see the blind as spiritually blind 
the poor as spiritually poor, or are they literally prisoners and, poor. and yes. the poor, and that the gospel is for them, and God has come in some way uh, to address them through the miracles, through the interventions, and that then carries on uh, in the gospels, uh, uh, and of course through the other passages. So it also centers on the theme of holiness, whether it's just personal or whether it is holiness in the way we relate to one another and the kind of society we create. You know. um, so a Christian um, cannot say this is personal ethics, but underpay his workers, don't give them the Sabbath and things of that sort. Uh, so I think a lot has to do with the theological interpretations. Uh, and the way we look at our role in society. Uh, and so the whole aspect of faith and society and its relevance and impact, that God wants to redeem the world you know, uh, in, in a sense, without losing sight of personal salvation and experience. I think at one time the church then shifted away and went into social gospel and only saw it in social terms. I don't think we are saying that. We are saying the spiritual is important. You have to address the issue of faith and belief uh, and confession of sin and belief uh, in salvation. But that salvation works out uh, for goodness of human society. That in doesn't in any way mean that it's a salvation of works. Uh, but it's a salvation that redeems uh, and that it makes impact. And I think for the church, many people narrow the experience and become comfortable Christians, middle class, affluent Christians, whose lives are not really being challenged to simplicity or to sacrificial giving. So in many ways, even for Christians, 10% giving is not the problem. But is the biblical teaching only 10? Or as the Lord leads you, you know, mm. to be really generous. Mm. Uh, and, and so all those challenges are now coming up uh, in terms of the kind of work we are called to do. So the Bible has a lot of social teachings yes. that we have missed out. And we see Jesus as only priest and king. We forgot Jesus is also prophet, priest and king. Yeah. Yeah. The dimension of prophet. You know? Yeah, and uh, since we are talking about this dichotomy, uh, let me just give you an example. Uh, this was many years ago when I was having a conversation with a brethren leader, uh, not William Dorai right? something, <laughs> but a brethren leader, uh, and he was a lawyer. And I said to him that one of the problems that we brethren, in terms of our understanding of our Christian faith, engagement in issues of public life and society, is this. It's got to do with our theology. Uh, and I use this word, uh, quote unquote, no? our brand of Christianity, our type of Christianity, how we understand our Christianity, our Christian faith. Uh, and so I stressed it to him that, you know, because of our understanding of Christianity is such that we have narrowed it down or we have missed it or underread it. Uh, and, I've, and, I, I, I've, and I've emphasized it to him. And his response to me was this. His response to me is, and in, 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 in doing that, I also challenge him and say that you are a lawyer, you are doing all these human rights cases. Uh, why are you doing these human rights cases if it's not because of your theological understanding? His reply to me was a very simple reply, but which illustrated to me, uh, and uh, you know, then it began to challenge me and to think further. He simply this, he said this, I don't think it's a theological problem. I don't think it's a theological problem. And we, he disputed me. And I said to him, he said, you are a lawyer doing this. Why, if it's not a theological problem, why are you doing this? And his answer is this. He says, I'm doing this because this is my job as a lawyer. My job as a lawyer. Now, what essentially he was telling me is that as I went back to think about it, it my understanding of theology is well, it is good, it is my personal uh, commitment, my personal ethics and all. But when it comes to human rights, it is my job, my duty as a lawyer to do it. 
he did not see the connection between his duty and his job as a lawyer with faith. And I think this is the, the, just a simple illustration that this is the problem that the Christian church in Malaysia and maybe by and large in the past, historically, we have been faced with this dichotomy. And I want to emphasize this again because this is something that I think has plagued the Malaysian church uh, through these years. Uh, of course, as Denison said, things are improving. Increasingly, people are beginning to recognize that this is not the thinking that it ought to be. Mm. But, but having said that, there are still many Christians who do not think this way. They still dichotomize their faith and they get very sensitive when it comes to issues of public life, society, and some even go to say, as they accuse me of doing. Uh, I'm not sure whether you have that experience. They said, Eugene, you have become a bit too early. <laughs> a bit too early. Well, for him, it's backside. I have become a bit too worldly. Too worldly. Yeah, I think um, I certainly resonate with what uh, both of you have has mentioned. Uh, Eugene, you mentioned about uh, the gentleman and talk about my job. And I think in my introduction, that was what I was alluding to. Could we uh, human rights people have two documents that we refer to? One is the Bible and the other is the UN HDR. Universal or Declaration, Declaration of, human, of human, rights. human Rights. You know, can we say, oh, you know, my life, my normal, you know, everyday life is uh, the word of God, lah. you know, but for my job, the document is the UNHDR. So I think now we are trying to see, can my faith actually inform and actually enrich um, my work in the human rights sphere? Uh, even of course, the UNHDR is a very good document. But I think we are trying to say here that the gospel is also sufficient uh, to inform what our personal lives should look like, but also as well the society life. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, Dato, I've certainly come across you know, that passage in Luke 4, um, in which uh, some Christians call it the Jesus Manifesto. You know, I have come, the Spirit of the Lord uh, has come upon me uh, so that I can preach good news to the poor. And um, I think when I was young in church, like, what does it mean poor? Oh, it means you are poor as well, you know? Do you feel poor? You know, do you feel like oh, you're, you're spiritually poor? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are yeah. you spiritually, spiritually poor? poor? You know, God is there for you as well. I think it extends to those who do feel spiritually poor, but it doesn't exclude those, or it doesn't have the allegorical meaning that, oh, it is spiritual, and not those who are materially poor. And I think the same uh, treatment goes to the Beatitudes. Um, you know, blessed are those poor, who are poor, poor in and also blessed are those who fight, uh, who hunger for righteousness uh, and justice. And I've heard, oh, actually, the righteousness and justice doesn't mean the society for society. It actually means righteousness. Your personal righteousness with God. You know, your relationship with God. So uh, we shouldn't use it to talk about. I, I think one of the difficulties we have in uh, biblical interpretation. Uh, is that the context is not taken seriously, the biblical context. The period in which Jesus came was actually uh, imperial Rome ruled, uh, and the Jewish community, the nation of Israel in that sense, were actually under foreign occupation, and the reality of prisoners who might be victimized for various other uh, unjust taxation, uh, brutality, uh, and all that kind. You know. So in that context, when the, um, the hearer of the words of Jesus sees it, it comes as messages of hope to them, uh, of freedom, uh, also from political oppression of that time. Uh, but we have sort of, uh, because we are coming from a middle class perspective now, uh, or from an affluent situation, or from a theological interpretation that dichotomizes spiritual and non-spiritual, secular uh, and sacred, these kind of uh, breakups, which then affects. And, and I think this is where theology has to be redone. The reading of theology mm. or understanding of religion, uh, and to engage or to engage without losing the substance of faith. 
I think for evangelicals, whether we come from the mainstream uh, denominations or from the freer uh, churches, uh, evangelical theology has been quite conservative. So it's been people like John Stott uh, in the post-Luzon experience uh, brought a much broader understanding without diluting the substance of faith and salvation, but moving on to contemporary reflections on human rights, environment, uh, justice, injustice, and so forth in society, or even role in governance uh, of society, yes. politics, that where we are motivated from a Christian faith dimension as a contribution of like what Eugene started off as loving our neighbor, uh, which then that neighbor is not just a Christian neighbor, but it's a neighbor, you know, who's a real neighbor or a neighbor in need, you know. Uh, and that kind of broader understanding is something uh, that we need much more teaching and training in that context. But our discipleship programs, all kinds of things narrow it down. And that's where we are struggling uh, yeah. in that context. It's interesting that you brought up this thing about, uh, you know, our theological understanding of human rights and then we have a document in the United Nations Human Rights, you know. Uh, this reminded me of a conversation I have, you know. Mm. And this Christian told me, you know, he says, uh, Eugene, why you talk about human rights all the time? Uh, after all, where do we get this idea of human rights? This idea of human rights actually came from that United Nations uh, Human Rights Declaration. It is a secular document. Now, the conversation was very telling in the sense that uh, it shows us that we think that when it comes to the, issue, the, the rights that we have, uh, the core rights that we have has come to known as human rights, is actually coming from a secular body, a secular document, but never came from the Bible. We always think that issues of freedom of religion came because of a secular document that informs us. But that's not the case. No. That's not the case. All these secular documents, if you want to call it that way, actually reflected an understanding. And that understanding comes from an understanding of human dignity. And that understanding of human dignity is theological. So the point of the thing about this illustration, as you mentioned, it is uh, we divorce the two and take it that because there was such a document that talks about human rights, therefore our understanding of human rights comes from this document. No, the, the understanding did not, human rights did not originate from a document. Human rights actually came from a theological understanding, which I think sadly for some Christian, for some Christian, uh, that's missed out. That's missed out. So I just want to bring a very practical example of something that has happened, but it reflects a problem. And this is where I think our discipleship, you know, I would agree with what Denison said, we have to cure this defect by having a more holistic discipleship, a discipleship that talks about this thing head on. The point that Eugene makes uh, on Christians, some Christians saying this is a secular document, the same argument is coming from the Islamist as yes, well. Yes, yes. And they say this is atheistic or secular, it's not coming from God. And that in itself is wrong because the idea of dignity and rights is coming from the creation passage. Yes. So if we, if we take a, 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 a theistic perspective of creation, uh, centered on God and creation and uh, dignity and rights of the person created in the image of God, that's reflected in the UDHR. The document. Yeah. Yes. I think the difficulty there is sexuality rights yes. and a few other areas where people would feel uh, conservative uh, understanding of sexuality or the rights at, attained to uh, abortion or these areas, that those are areas that one can look at. But uh, to then see, okay, if these are uh, biblical or theological or faith understanding, is it contradictory to other documents that come? Because it's also inspired, and I think Eugene as well knows, 
that the personalities who were involved in the drafting committee had very strong uh, theistic and God-fearing understanding convictions. because it came in the context of the abuses of the second, first and second, second world, world war and that humanity as a whole felt that no other human being should be treated in this way and that governments will ensure that th they will not dehumanize people. Mm -hmm. And that's actually coming from anyone who has any sense of belief in God. How has it been? How has, has your ministry and your kind of work, has it been well received by the church? Well, generally there are few types of responses that we are talking from the church. Uh, when you talk about uh, society engagement and good for society, there is the Christians, group of Christians who say, well, this is uh, worldly things, we will have nothing to do with it, and so we don't really want to support you. You, know, you can go ahead and do your thing, God bless you. Uh, there is also another group of Christians who say, well, uh, these sort of things are a waste of time because uh, you, know, you can spend so much time on it, it hardly brings any change. What is more important is that uh, the spiritual atmosphere, the the, 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 what you call, the heavens must open and continually to open in order for blessing from God to pour out. So what we need to do is to engage in the spiritual warfare, engage in prayer, have this altar, have that altar, so that at the end of the day, God's uh, heaven will continually to be open and the blessing can flow down to humanity. So there's another group of Christians that, that way. Mm -hmm. uh, another group of Christians, of course, because of their more comfortable secular lifestyle, uh, and, and because they are probably upper middle class, mm. uh, there's a lot of indifference. Mm. Uh, these are not important things. No? As long as I come to church, have my worship, attend my cell group regularly, uh, all things is well. All things is well. No? And we just, in God we trust. Mm. You know? And of course, a, a smaller group of Christians who will say, well, we want to do this. So the, I would say that the responses are mixed, mm. depending on who you talk to depending on which leader that you engage with. But really, there's really no one answer uh, in the sense that uh, whether my reception has been good, cool, or uh, very, very uh, lukewarm, or is it outright rejection? It really depends on who you are engaging with at the end of this, and the responses is mixed. Uh, having said that, I think what, what I would want to say is this, irrespective of the responses, I think, uh, what we need to do is to just carry on. Mm. Uh, because if we believe that this is theological, if we believe that this is what God has implanted to the mission of the church, then I think the question here is that we need to be faithful. We need to be faithful. But as we do so, uh, one of the uh, things that I always caution in my mind, at the back of my mind, even as I engage with those who are not totally with us or he wouldn't be critical with us, is, uh, I don't think it's good for us to be uh, judgmental mm. or condemning mm. others. Uh, I'm reminded that in my own personal journey, uh, as I said, uh, I am 42 years in the Brethren Church, but it is only the last 10 to 15 years or maybe the last 15 years that I have come to realize this. Mm. So I'm reminded that even then in my own personal, personal life, it was a journey of discovery that led me to where I am. Mm. And so Consequently, I also must be gracious for those who are critical or who may not be supportive. They too may have their own journey. Mm -hmm. And who knows, who knows, the day will come when they too will be able to see mm -hmm. uh, the light of this in their own personal journey. So I think that's the, the hope that I think we must bear. God is sovereign, God is working, and God will transform. Not all perhaps, but there will always be those whom he will call in their personal journey. And I think as I listen, both of us have our personal journey and throughout our personal journey, we came to see this. Likewise, it can happen to those who are critical of us or those who are not supportive of us. Right? God is still in control. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. I, I think in terms of my own um, journey over the years um, from a Methodist background, I think the church's practice of Methodism sort of miss the uh, unique holiness movement of the Methodist movement, yeah. as well as its strong uh, social dimensions of the Wesleyan movement to British society. You know? mm -hmm. 
I think that component of Methodism impacting the labor movement, the, uh, the political, the uh, even actually bringing restoration to society without a kind of blood revolution, uh, but bringing change, you know, as a result of revival. I think something that's something the church over the years had has lost to a point of narrowing down Christian ministry and faith. You know? yeah. So I would say in my journey, or at least my younger years, uh, there is an element of impatience with the church. You know? mm. So you, you're part of um, a younger, younger sort of activist within the church who feels that if God's calling me into the next level, you know, why should I listen to my leader and I would just walk away and carry on. So in that process and that approach over the years, one then begins to see the church left behind in a very far way, in my own experience, uh, from pastoral work to social work uh, to policy work and now academic work. I see the essence of my faith being strengthened on a daily basis because I see it as an outworking of faith. But the church might not see it in that way because they have defined faith uh, in very narrow sense. And they are then just taking up social concerns, maybe handouts to people. They might do some uh, social work. They're not involved in, let's say, migrant labor reform, mm. uh, trade unions, which is part of the Methodist heritage. Mm. Uh, so in that sense, the church um, is left behind mm. uh, and there is a kind of a frustration uh, till in the last few years mm. uh, in the change of my shift into DUMC that I have found pastors who mm. might be cautious but supportive yep. of this uh, intervention in society. Mm. They would pray for it. They see it as a Christian vocation. Yep. They would see Christians must be in all, all sectors of society and there is the legitimate place. Mm. Uh, so there is then an application of uh, faith, theology to contemporary issues. Mm. Although the church action might not be there. Mm. Uh, church might say, okay, talk about it, tree, pray about it and all. Mm. But your citizens action uh, is outside. It's not the church doing it, but as individuals you can team up with others, mm -hmm. but recognizing it as a legitimate expression. Mm -hmm. So I think the church over the years has moved into compassionate ministries mm -hmm. in a very big way. So if we take uh, most of the organized uh, social ministries now, mm -hmm. it's very strong. The element of justice we are seeing through civil society action and professional bodies, mm. it's largely led by mm. someone from a Christian background mm. in some of the major, whether it is a professional law society uh, or it is an activist movement. Mm. Uh, very strong Christians are actually in the movement working with mm. others, mm. motivated from a faith dimension mm but seeing the need to work with others to bring restoration in society. Mm. Um, I think there is less prayer support for such workers mm. as opposed to if you went out um, as a missionary or somewhere to do church planting, then you are called up and people pray for you. Mm. But now if you say, I'm, I'm called to be uh, in a reform movement in Malaysia, mm. or I'm fighting for land rights, or I'm working rights for indigenous people, mm. or I'm doing protection uh, for sex workers, mm. or human trafficking. Uh, and that, I think there are very few churches that will commission such a person, mm. pray for them regularly. Mm. And I think those kind of changes need to come. Mm. But in the forefronts in the country, I think there are many committed Christians or Christians from different denominations mm. 
very influential position. Mm. And that's a positive line because they are associated, at least on Sundays, in cell groups, mm. uh, they are articulating their action mm. uh, in that way. Even in land rights, a lot of indigenous people in Sabah, Sarawak, mm. who are mobilizing, uh, let's say from the SIB context, have a very strong faith dimension and they feel they need to do something in society. So I think the, the sort of political action, individuals might not be then saying, this is a Christian group doing, but the Christian is seeing himself or herself as an active citizen, not just as a taxpayer, but someone praying, but someone going out to do something. I've seen so many Christians on in demonstrations now, in meetings, uh, in writing, in legal litigation work, mm. being motivated, but they are doing this as a contribution to humanity mm. as a whole mm. uh, and trying to build a better society. Mm. Uh, so in one sense, um, you don't have huge ministries by the churches like um, uh, Society for Justice or something like that, funded by Christians, mm. like Legal Aid or something. It's not coming out in a big way. Mm. Like I think in the Catholic side, the Jesuit priest yeah. tends to play a huge role yeah. uh, for reform. That kind of movements within our ones have not emerged. But individuals, yes, um, and, yeah. and groups. So there are some encouraging signs mm. But we have a long way to go. Um, uh, and, but we have also seen a large number of mm. Christians in politics elected. Mm. They have held responsible positions. Mm. Uh, they have been very effective on the ground. Mm. Uh, not just from a faith dimension, mm. but being you know, humble, uh, relating to people, mm. working. And that's positive. Okay, thank you. So I think from what I gather, what we are gathering here uh, today is that there, is, there seems to be some disconnect between church life and um, public witness in terms of structure, uh, structural matters in society, political, whether uh, social or economic. Um, and the experiences of Christians who are involved in such areas, because they are informed by theology, uh, not, not just because it's a job. The experiences of such individuals as the both of you um, can be frustrating uh, and can also be perhaps uh, lonely, perhaps. Um, I think this conversation is definitely a wake-up call for me and I hope uh, for many Christians as well mm. um, to see the gospel a, from a broader perspective, uh, from a more three-dimensional or nowadays four-dimensional uh, perspective. But also I think, um, Eugene, from what you mentioned as well, that uh, we also um, need to be prayerful and pray that um, the church can go move forward on this journey um, to, be a, to be more aware of the role that we play in society. And so, um, uh, and so I'd like to end with a question uh, of moving forward. What kind of hope do you have uh, what, um, is it a hopeful situation? I mean, the, does Malaysia have hope? Um, can Christians uh, be a beacon of light in society? Um, and how can the church come alongside such work? I, I want to take off the point where Denison mentioned, and I think it's a very important positive point. He says that in his observation, uh, the church as a collective uh, unit body may not be, uh, we are talking about in the context of Malaysia, may not be uh, that actively engaged uh, as compared to say in the Western nations like the States or Europe where you have churches, you have uh, uh, their, their NGO societies are driven by, by, by Christians and churches. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't have that yet. But I think he mentioned a very important point that in his experience, and I would agree the last 10 years, you know, especially during my time when I was early days when I was in NECF and now, that there are more and more individual Christians mm. who are out there doing what they can in their personal capacity. Uh, and I think the history of the Christian church, if you look at it, 
uh, has never been so vibrant in terms of the individual participation as compared to, say, uh, 15, 20 years ago. I remember in those days after the Operation Lalang of the 87, we just mm. celebrated the, <laughs> the anniversary. Uh, I always tell the leaders that the church retreated as a result of the Operation Lalang. Uh, uh, but thank God the journey has been the last 30 years, it has come back now. Mm. Churches have now moved in terms of the individual and I think we see uh, some churches here and there coming forward. So that's one very encouraging point. But I also want to add this. The other encouraging point is, is that as we interact with civil society, non-Christian, we are seeing that conversely the non-Christian groups are also arising. They are not Christians but they are also arising. Uh, and we have to take this that God, while God is working through the church, God is also sovereignly working among wider society. And within the wider society, we see non-Christian groups are also having this movement. Mm -hmm. We see a lot of committed individual citizens who are not Christians in faith. There may be other religious persuasion, but they are also actively engaging with the Christians. So that's the second point of encouragement that I think we need to see. And I want to add that even in this respect, even we are beginning to see more and more younger generation of Muslims who are coming out mm. to speak of some of the problems, the internal problems with their religion. They are also coming out to actually voice out the discrimination, the oppression, the oppression and the injustices that are happening that are committed in the name of Islam. Mm. So if we look at it collectively, the individual movement from the church, the individual movements from the non-Christians, in particular even, even the Muslim groups, uh, and view this as a collective movement, we can see that I think God has not forgotten Malaysia, and Malaysia does have a hope. Mm -hmm. And I think we can be hopeful that in the days to come, the church as an institution, uh, we talk about the NECF, uh, to a large extent CCM has done that, right? the Catholic Church has a social action, but we are also hopeful that in the East Malaysia, we are seeing the Sabah Council of Churches and even the Association of Churches of Sarawak will begin to, one day, begin, they are beginning to be more conscious and we are hopeful that they too as an institution will come on board and start to engage on issues of public life and society. That's the hope. Awesome. What about you, Dato? Okay, I, I would think the church as a whole suffers from this kind of minority syndrome man where they feel they are small and uh, too small to make an impact. Mm. Failing to realize that 10% nationally uh, is a sizable minority uh, in the nation of uh, 32 million, uh, then 10% is very significant but scattered around. So if we take uh, Peninsula, then you are seeing, in, at least in the Klang Valley, real mega churches that are huge in number, in resources, in the kind of people in the congregations, uh, from all kinds of professions, influence in private sector, uh, in academia and things like that. So the potential is untapped uh, within the context of the church and the influence it can play. And I think that's coming out with, as Eugene and I agree, the individuals are making an impact through professional bodies. They are motivated. Uh, they are not corrupt. Uh, they want to see some change. They are motivated, hardworking, and they want to see some change uh, in, you know, in the way. And they're motivated from a faith dimension, but willing to work with anyone. So that's positive and I think we're going to see an increased movement mm. uh, along that line. So if we take the mega churches, mm. the cell groups, mm. we take the social organizations that are all self-financed. Mm. They're not dependent on Western funding uh, for the social ministries now. On the other side of Sabah and Sarawak, mm. we have downplayed or not built sufficiently mm. the size of the church uh, in Sabah, which is over 20%, and I think Sarawak is over 30, right? 30 to 40%. 42%. 42% of the population 
it's not a minority church yeah, majority. and they are majority so like I'm I'm uh, you know n n not from the east so I don't have the so to go to a village and mm. see the whole village is Christian mm. and the church as the center of the village and then you got a school and things like that uh, that kind of picture has not come out strongly you know mm. because the peninsula churches are so strong and the majority 60 percent of christians are actually bahasa speaking their bumiputra church and that is not a much so it's a tremendous potential uh, in in that light and this is where i think uh, john roxborough's uh, uh, last writings on the history mm. where he then brings out that the christian church is indigenous to malaysia on the principle that when Sabah and Sarawak uh, mm. together with the peninsula formed Malaysia, mm. the Bumiputras of Sabah and Sarawak were already Christians, you know. Mm. So his argument is it's an indigenous church yeah. in 1963. Uh, that's part of the one. But the presentation, the recognition of diversity is not strong enough. And part of the reason is the type of clergy, mm. the training exposure, mm. uh, the, you know, I'm not running the uh, East Malaysian pastor, mm. uh, or the, the, the um, you know, leaders, but they're coming from the poorer churches, you mm. know, and the resources. Uh, so even in Sabah and Sarawak, the Christians who are more well-to-do are coming from the Chinese yeah. uh, churches. So t until and unless the indigenous church builds up its financial capacity, mm. there are more professionals emerging, mm. um, then you will see this tremendous influence mm. uh, coming from East uh, into, and also for mm. the churches here to respond. Mm. So we have tremendous potential, mm. untapped potential, mm. but for this I think, the church needs to really look at academicians, mm. church historians, mm. economists, and it has to come from affluent families now mm. as a vision setting apart at least one child uh, into mm. one of these fields, yeah. history, economics, yeah. I mean law I think they're already in, accountancy, business, uh, medicine, law, they are all in but other fields that are needed mm. uh, into academic, yep. into public service, uh, get into PTD mm. uh, and things of that sort. And, and I think that will make uh, an eventual uh, impact mm. and that is something we need to look at, not because we want to Christianize the thing, mm. but we want to see that Christians have a legitimate uh, role mm as citizens of the land and we have the ability to contribute to national development mm. uh, and our presence will bring corruption down mm. it should bring a better society mm. that is more holy and pleasing to god mm. and that has to come out of out working of faith mm. in the public arena mm. and i have that hope that the church would move to that yeah. And I think that's where we need to make sure theological colleges move in that teaching. Yep. Okay, uh, that's all for tonight. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, we have covered a lot of ground. We have talked about <laughs> everything under the sun. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for your time. And um, yeah, we'll look forward to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.